tonight's program, Wendy Wisher Reflecting Hope. This installation is part of Low Creative Projects, which invites site-specific installations by emerging and mid-career artists to foster creativity and experimentation. This is a relatively new space at the Low Art Museum. It's placed in the front of the museum near the lobby with these large glass windows facing the street. So it helps us try to bring art also to UM campus and bring the work that's installed there to a wider audience. And it's an exciting space and we're essentially rotating artists um, with installations every three to four months in that space. So tonight's uh, guests, and thank you so much, Wendy and Lance, for joining us. I'll just give a little bit of background on each of them, and then I'm going to hand it over to Wendy and Lance. So Wendy Wisher is an artist and associate professor at the University of Utah. Um, Wendy currently lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. She received her MFA from Florida State University in 1995 and a BFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison 1993. Wisher creates work in a variety of media from sculptural objects to installations, video, and public works. Much of the artwork is based on blurring the separation between the intrinsic history of working with nature and the cutting edge of new media. She's a recipient of numerous grants, including the Paula Krasner Grant, the South Florida Consortium, the Florida Individual Artist Fellowship, and the Utah Division of Art, Arts and Museum Visual Arts Fellowship. Wendy has exhibited extensively Nationally and her international exhibits include Spain, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, Italy, and Israel. She is an alumni of the Creative Capital Professional Development Program, and her work is part of several public collections, including the Perez Art Museum, Art Bank, Art in Public Places uh, Miami, a permanent outdoor installation with Art in Public Places Miami Beach, the Boca Museum of Art in Boca Raton, Florida, and the Utah Division of Arts and Museums Collection. And thank you so much, Wendy, for joining us tonight and for your wonderful installation at the Low. And just a little background on Lance Fung, our curator. Lance is the chief curator of Fung Collaboratives, an arts organization that conceives and realizes contemporary art exhibitions around the world. Lance collaborates and uh, Fung Collaboratives has had the pleasure to commission many artists and architects to realize new site-specific works, such as one being discussed this evening. Lance has created important exhibitions such as revisiting Gordon Monte Clark at Next, the Venice Architectural Biennial in Venice, Italy, the Snow Show, Venice at the 50th International Art Exhibition, um, the Ship of Tolerance by uh, Ila and Emilia Tabakov in Siwa, Egypt, and Dreams and Conflicts, the viewer's uh, dictatorship in Venice, Italy. Crossing parallels at the Samzi space in Seoul, Korea, and going home at the Edward Hopper Historical Museum in Nyack, New York. Lance is also a member of the International Association of Curators of Contemporary Art and the International Council of Museums. And thank you both so much, Lance and Wendy, for joining us. And with fur without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. So I'm going to stop sharing, Wendy. Well, thanks. And I'm delighted to be here. So thanks for um, setting this up. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Um, and hi, Wendy. Um, I'm coming in from California, where we're getting uh, pounded with more rain. And I think Wendy is getting ready for some more snow. Yes. Because <laughs> you're out there in Utah. Um, I was in Miami. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to give a little bit of context to the, um, to the viewers. Um, I met Wendy a number of years ago when Funk Collaboratives um, was working on Illuminate Coral Gables. So we had an intensive year to year period of uh, interviewing artists, doing studio visits, uh, and basically doing artistic research of artists primarily from the Miami region. Um, during that first year of uh, uh, curating and realizing Illuminate Coral Gables, simultaneously, my job was to also start working on the second iteration for Illuminate Coral Gables, which was to have a theme revolving around environmental issues, climate change, and sea level rise. And it was through that um, overview that museum people, curators, artists of Miami all said, you really should uh, do some research on Wendy Wisher and her artwork, uh, which I did. Um, I hope all of you will visit her website. It's very thorough, robust, easy to navigate, and it also has a bunch of really good informative videos. 
of our video based work and of our installations. And so through all of that research, uh, I instantly fell in love with Wendy's work. And I saw the relevancy of her work, particularly under the umbrella of creating a site specific new work um, in Coral Gables. And so we began a conversation, which now has resulted in a friendship. Uh, one of the best things that came about this earlier research work was um, years later, um, I was communicating with Jill at the Low, and this concept of the Low Creative Project came up. And so at that moment, I was invited to curate the uh, first six exhibitions, um, all of Miami-based artists. And Wendy was certainly at the top of the list, along with the other five artists who uh, will be exhibiting uh, before and after Wendy. Um, one of the reasons why I felt Wendy would be perfect for this opportunity um, is many of the conversations that we had on Zoom was her ability to work with uh, natural and artificial light to create an experience and also to create an artwork that, that bridged day into night so that truly the artwork would be visible 24 seven. And that is exactly the wonderful physical property of the exhibition space that the Lowe has provided for their Low Creative Projects series. Uh, so I reached out to Wendy. She was very excited and interested in returning back to Miami uh, to create um, uh, an installation befitting that space. Uh, it was an interesting challenge because when she came up with her proposal and it started to liaise with myself and the Lowe Museum, the space wasn't even finished yet. It was a former sort of reception space and also the back bit of it was I think storage or an office. So it was just uh, getting underway the renovation and especially unwrapping the windows so that people could see the work anytime and they could come into the space or also just peer from outside. Uh, and so for me, that is why uh, Wendy was invited um, to show her work, which I'm really, really proud of. The rest of today's presentation is not me speaking. It is uh, the opportunity of listening to Wendy talk about her work um, this installation and basically her long vision and overview of her art practice, which is really phenomenal. So Wendy, I'm gonna uh, ask you a question, uh, um, one of three that I would love for you to answer because I think the questions that I've uh, worked out um, helps guide you through past and present and future of your work, as well as your inspirations and the robust, unique quality and process that you in are engaged in. Question number one, Wendy. Um, I would love for you to share your personal and intellectual underpinnings of your love for the planet and, and how that is translated into your practice. Also, as one of the few artists who I know that collaborates with all sorts of people, can you share your intentions and process of collaborating with scientists and academic research? Yeah, well, again, um, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for uh, putting me in the show and I'm delighted to talk with all of you. Um, you know, my, really my work has always been inspired by my passion for the natural environment. It really um, ended up kind of forming who I was. Um, and so I've always made work um, about the natural environment. And also, um, you know, my, my whole theory was if we love something, we tread lighter. So and my hopes in sharing some of that was to pass on some of that um, affection that I feel for the planet. But in more recent years with our global climate crisis, I have really felt compelled to use my platform to discuss these things a little bit more intensely. Um, and sometimes my work has become somewhat political and that's because our leaders have made climate change political. Um, and my position here at the University of Utah, I've really had the opportunity to work with scientists and engineers um, in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaborations that focus on the global climate crisis that we're in, environmental issues, and I often refer to my work as I'm trying to, to uh, translate data into personal meaning. So I'm going to share with you um, a, just a couple of projects um, that I've done with as examples of what I've done with um, scientists to show you 
um, as a start. So this particular project is called Displacing Vibrations. This is a collaboration with geologist and geophysicist Jeff Moore. Um, this picture is uh, out at Sunset Arch in central Utah um, with his team. Jeff has been using seismic vibration recorders to basically determine the structural integrity of these red rock arches. This is um, a technology that was first used on skyscrapers to determine how the wind was affecting uh, the structural integrity. And he learned he could turn it into natural phenomenon, first uh, detecting avalanches in Europe, and then to these red rock arches. Um, through part of our process, uh, I made a series of works and an exhibition called Displacing Vibrations. Um, and Jeff provided these boundaries of the former and current boundaries of Grand Staircase Escalante and Bears Ears National Monuments in, in Utah. Uh, on the left, we have Grand Staircase Escalante. In 2017, the boundaries were slashed by 47%. And they had been in place since 1996. And on the right, you can see Bears Ears, um, which was slashed by 85%. Um, and so I created these boundaries in acrylic mirror so that the viewers saw themselves and didn't see themselves in the fragments, saw themselves both as stakeholders and also as part of um, the ecological footprint in this area. Since then, the boundaries have been restored by under the Biden administration. However, the Utah state legislatures are suing the Biden administration for, for doing that. Across from them was a chalk drawing of Sunset Arch, and I had erasers, but no chalk. These arches took millennia to form. There was about 115 that lost federal protection when the boundaries shifted. And once they're gone, all we have left is a photo. So there was erasers, but no chalk to add to it. I also used some of the um, vibrational data, which comes in at four Hertz, which is way below what humans can hear. We hear somewhere between 20 and 200 and created an animation with many layers that had the ground uh, vibrating and shaking in tune with the sounds. And then I also um, created, oh, it's not wanting me to, um, created a, an installation, a sound installation, their surround sound that we amplified it and sped up these uh, vibrations. I mixed them with other tones and nature sounds recorded out. And so this also had a high powered subwoofer and the viewers could feel as well as hear the vibrational sounds. Jeff and I were really interested in making this very appearingly static, lifeless landscape dynamic, and it responds to the things around it, not only our footprints, but certainly the ATVs that are very common in this area and the extraction companies that are drilling alongside of it. Uh, another example is called Evaporated Explorations in Art, Science, and Salt. This is with another geologist, Brenda Bowen, um, about her research out on the Bonneville Salt Flats, which is just in the, the um, kind of western corner of Utah. And this was, we had the opportunity to not only show the work that I created in collaboration inspired by her research, but we showed it alongside the, uh, the science itself. So we had this opportunity at the, the Granary, which is a really cool gallery in the center of Utah in Ephraim. Um, and we had science on some of the walls to really show like what inspired the artwork and hopefully have people who are, were drawn more to the art be directed back to the data. Um, we've also written a paper uh, with the same title that's gonna be published in the Leonardo uh, Press Direct this summer. One of the pieces that I created is a sound sculpture. It's a giant chunk of salt. Um, and I was fascinated that they had discovered, although there is no life, there's no, appearingly no life, there's no um, vegetation that grows on the salt flats, but they found out that it's exhaling CO2 every 24 hours. And so there's something that is breathing. And so this is called To Breathe. It has a set of headphones um, and it's breathing sounds mixed with other ambient tones and sounds. Another piece that I created as part of this dealt with the speed racing. Uh, the Bonneville Salt Flats is where speed records are broken, um, you know, broken and, and made. And it's really interesting that the salt flats is such a, a very simple technology. It's precipitation and evaporation. And so because we're in an almost decade drought, the precipitation has been really low and the salt flats are diminishing. Now there's some groundwater that also feeds into that, but primarily it's precipitation from the sky. 
Um, but the racers, they even have their own slogan, save the salt. They blame the extraction company that's right next to the salt flats. They extract the water, goes through a series of ponds, and they pull out different minerals and use it for potash. Um, but at the same time, the racers, they never stop racing, right? Even when conditions aren't great on the salts, they'll insist on racing and then they do more damage that takes multiple years to repair. So it's so interesting since I moved out here of understanding public lands and this incredible complexity of stakeholdership in a way that I, I really had no idea um, before I moved out West and kind because there is so much land that is public land. Um, and so that's one of the things that, um, you know, I've been really interested. So this tire was actually put in the mine. They let me put it in there to attract the salt. Um, and if they just kind of let things lay, the salt will grow back. Um, these salt crystals became about an inch, which is about as big as they grow. Uh, and, and incidentally, uh, salt is the only rock that we as humans can watch uh, form in our ecological time. And the last project I'll share with you before we move on um, is a recent project. This is called In Search of Blue Sky. It's a collaboration that I did with atmospheric scientist John Lynn and English PhD student Lindsay Webb. Um, and we uh, were really kind of tackling the poor air quality that exists here in the Salt Lake Valley. One, because we're in a valley, so with the mountains, when warm air passes over, it traps the air below, including all of its pollution. And we have oil refineries and medical incendiaries, and of course, all the traffic pollution, and there's still homes heated with coal and wood, believe it or not. So um, one of the things that John had been doing, uh, the atmospheric scientist, is their lab has put these kind of world-renowned uh, format of sensing the air quality, and they have sensors on top of our above ground railway system, which we call our track system. And it goes from one mountain range through the valley and up to the next mountain range. And it's recording um, air quality in real time. And it's putting it up on a website that everyone can see. They also have uh, sensors on some of the buses now, the electric buses. But most people in Salt Lake City do not even know that these sensors exist. So we wanted to try and bring attention to that. And we decided to use um, you know, poetic text as a form of bringing people together, uh, we all want our common ground is clean air. And most people associate clean air with blue sky, even though sometimes blue sky does not mean clean air and sometimes non-blue sky mean, doesn't always mean you know, poor air. But we've focused on the blue sky and clean air as a common ground place. And so we put signs on buses um, this is the closest one to data. It says we can live three weeks without food, three days without water, but only three minutes without air. Here's another one. The surface of the planet is at the bottom of the sea we call the sky. We did some on the back. Uh, my favorite one, which Lindsay came up with, is exhaust as a verb, to drain someone of their physical or mental resources. And the sky is falling. And we, we had others as well. Um, we also put signs inside the tracks cars um, and wanting to connect people. So here we have, we may be strangers, but we share the same air or another sky is possible. Some of them are thanking the viewers for riding public transportation. We're always telling people um, you know, to do it, to ride public transportation, to, to carpool, to come together, but we rarely thank those who do. Um, our, our campaign was also in Spanish since that's the second most largely spoken language here in Salt Lake City. And this QR code and the website um, lead to the app, uh, website that I created. In very simple language, it helps people understand what this atmospheric website is. So this is one of the links that um, is on the atmospheric website. And my, my website links them to it to help explain um, in a little bit more depth this air quality that we have. and. Um, this is one of those, uh, we also have pictures of the sensors. There's pictures of um, all the other signs and all the language that we used. If you're interested, the, the link is listed right there at the bottom of the slide. Um, and this website will continue on. It will continue to be a place where people can go and learn about this information and, and help them understand a little bit more deeply um, the data. And hopefully at the same time, come together. And, and just, I wanna conclude about the collaborations is I really feel that art is such an important collaborator with science. Um, we know that data doesn't move people. 
We know that emotions are what move people and art can ask questions without having to have an answer. It can provoke people. Um, it can, it, it's these emotions of what makes us act. And so while we need the data, we need a way to be able to communicate it to people where they can find personal meaning. My hope is that I'm creating work that might lead to impactful reason, resources for people to feel more closely with the environments they live in and with each other. And we need to imagine new ways of perceiving the world. We need, it's so much easier to imagine what we don't want and so much harder to imagine what we do. And art is gonna be key in helping us with these new visionary perspectives. And so I continue to, to work with scientists and engineers. Um, I, I find that uh, I'm diving and learning so much about my own environment and about the planet itself and the issues that I care about. Um, and so this is something that is a, a big passion of mine and that I plan to um, continue to do. Let's see, oh, I need to. There we go. Um, super thorough answer to my question. I just have a quick follow-up. Um, I've done a number of uh, curated efforts that involved collaborations of all sorts. And it's often pairing an artist or an artist finding another partner to work with. Working with a scientist um, uh, seems like it would be an interesting challenge because the language may be so different. Uh, does it differ working with a scientist versus with an artist? Is it a different sense of ego because you have expertise and different um, contributions? Or was it hard to get your visual idea across through the noise of bars and graphs and charts? I'm just kind of curious, like. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. And the more I've done this, the more I've learned and the more it's even changed my own perspective about what this could be. Initially, I thought, oh, I'd be putting uh, visuals to their data. Scientists are great at graphs. They can put the visuals to their data. It's just they're devoid of emotion and as is their discipline trains them, right? To, to not, to stay away from that um, and just share the observable evidence. You know, one language is certainly a, a, a barrier with any um, kind of collaboration, not just um, scientists, but also engineers, and also even within the arts and other humanities. Um, people will have the same word, but apply a different meaning to it. Uh, but also I've, I've found, which was really took a couple of years into it before I realized it's also about values. Different disciplines have different values. And so that can be um, something that has to be navigated. And certainly I'm, I'm in academia. In academia, the values of reward systems for different disciplines is incredible. Like the scientists don't care that they've been part of my art shows, um, but we publish papers and they put the papers on their resume. And for me, my discipline, okay, the papers are great, but it's the exhibitions that are the value. Um, and I think in terms of ego, you know, I've also collaborated with a number of musicians and poets and dancers, and uh, there's probably more ego there than with the scientists. At least they 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 feel they don't understand or they don't they don't take um, dominion over. But it was tricky to find scientists who were interested in the interdisciplinary collaboration and the scientists who wanted were open to another way of seeing. And for me, what was great is that. My creative problem solving process, I've been invited to be on a number of committees and this process that I use has opened the research because I'm asking questions from a naivete point of view. And I sometimes ask questions that has them rethink their research. And that was astounding to me. And, and I couldn't be more excited. And it just showed the value of creating problem solving process before the creation even of the objects or the performances or whatever it is. Um, that that process is a unique process. And I think that might be why Bell Laboratories turned to artists, right, in the 60s to explore their computer use, right? They wanted to see what they would do. And I think we're at that same place and there's more um, of an openness within the scientific community in certain circles um, to having artists contribute. Great, you know, it's interesting. Um, just listening to your answer, I, I, and I've not really collaborated with the scientists in, in a while. Um, I was working on a project working with marine biologists. The sense of urgency is different, right? So when you think of all of these environmental 
issues that our students are super proactive on. The scientist, the one who really drives the conversation, has a much more elongated timeline, right? And even on the news, there, there's a three-year study of microplastics um, coming from snow in the water. So the woman said, oh, we haven't evaluated the snow from last year. We're collecting snow samples this year, and we're starting to see this trend. And I'm thinking, can't you melt the snow faster? Can't you do this research so that we can learn more about the issue and hopefully affect a change? So I think I think your leading your answer is helping uh, to lead to my second question because you talked about emotions, right, and a sense of urgency. There, we're wired differently, but artists and 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 patrons of the art, I think, are wired more similarly. And so my second question relates a little bit to that, basically the humanness of being an artist and making art versus the intellectual or academic approach um, in which a scientist is mostly engaged in. Uh, one aspect of your work is, uh, I'm sorry, one special aspect of your work is your innate ability to create a visceral and immersive experience for the viewer. It's something I personally gravitate towards. I love conceptual-based art, intellectually rigorous art, but at the same token, it needs to provide some sort of experience, thought provocation for the viewer. So would you please explain um, how this is embedded in the overview of your work? All of your work, no matter it's a work created out of embedded salt in a tire, or it's a full-on installation, really um, is focusing on your viewer, uh, which I think is really important. So we go from science, research, collaboration, and then you flip the switch and it automatically puts the spotlight and focus on the viewer experience. So I'd love for everyone to hear a little bit more about your process and, and how you embed that. Yeah. I'm definitely really drawn to do installations. And I think um, in some ways it's because I'm interested in the natural environment and the experience of being in the natural environment is a multi-sensory experience. And so if I'm going to represent that, it's best done when I can also have the ways that we hear things, um, you know, through sound, uh, how we move, if there is something to, to touch or places to sit, not always, um, but certainly light uh, is experienced. So I've been really interested in um, using kind of this immersive thing to really uh, take hold of the viewer's senses, uh, if you will. Uh, I also I was thinking about this and I, I think some of it comes back. I remember as a child, I would go to the Milwaukee Historical Museum and they had this old cobblestone street with all these like shops on either side. And there was, um, you could go up and look in the window, stand on the porches, sometimes go in. And there was a horse, you know, a taxidermied horse and carriage. And I think that that ability to completely transform time and space and, and tell a story that is so all encompassing, that is something that I continue to be inspired by and try to do in some of my work. And I'll share um, a few pieces that uh, relate to this. Um, one is called Written on the Wind. And this is a piece that was commissioned by the Natural History Museum uh, here in Utah, the Natural History Museum of Utah for their 50th anniversary called Nature All Around Us. Um, and their exhibition Nature All Around Us kind of did uh, showed back nature in your backyard, nature in open spaces, in parks, in um, Main Street, in downtown. Um, and then it also talked about uh, nature's physical health benefits and mental health benefits. And I was commissioned to do a piece about how nature makes us feel. And this is a 17 foot spiral room with 360 degrees of video. Um, it kind of emulates 24 hours and 24 minutes. It goes from sunrise uh, to sunrise. So there's the sunset and the moonrise. Um, it's a little bit of a mix of imagery that is representational. Um, there were these uh, clouds that you could sit and relax into um, that moved around the room. And um, some abstractions. I worked with a couple of composers for the sound component for this piece. I was really trying to capture fragments of the joy and curiosity and sublime that we feel um, when we're out in nature. And this piece has been remade by the Science Museum of Minnesota. It's set to travel for the next six to 10 years across the country in Canada 
the next, it was shown at, um, in St. Paul this past fall and winter, and next it's moving to another city um, in Minnesota called the Wheel and Cog Museum in a smaller town. Um, and so I'm really excited that the work has been able to kind of translate into these science and natural history venues. Um, certainly it was a challenge uh, to make work for a hands-on, um, children, family-focused place, uh, very different than the white walls don't touch or touch with your eyes um, kind of situation. Um, but I'm, I'm truly honored to be part of that um, piece. And when doing this, it really um, kind of had me think, go back to this idea, if we love something, we tread lighter. And so um, kind of finding these connections with nature uh, has come full circle in some ways with my work. Um, another piece that I'll talk about, this was um, uh, Parallel Journeys. This was part of the Florida Gulf Coast University's Art and Science Residency Program. Um, they invited me to attend this residency program. So about six months, I traveled back and forth. I worked with um, a marine biologist and ecologist, Wynne Everham and his students. Um, while I was there. And I created a six channel uh, multimedia installation. So there's surround sound, there was a floating 16, 16 foot by nine foot screen, five monitors on the wall that kind of had a moving landscape um, image. And with this piece, I really was thinking about how there's just such a small section of our conscious mind, like 5% that is active. And then there's only about 5% of the ocean that we've discovered. And I really think this, the solution is, is inside us. We have to dive deep and figure out what is it about our psychological makeup, our, our human instincts that have us destroy the home that provides for us, that has us um, make decisions that hurt us and hurt others. And so uh, this piece is about that. It dives in and, uh, in and out of um, kind of the conscious and unconscious mind above and below the surface. It has whispered fragments of poems uh, from Sylvia Plath um, and thinking about um, you know, what, what we can find if we actually turn in that maybe that's where part of the solution is. And then another piece I'll share with you really uh, became very emotional. This piece is called um, Your Memory is Already Fading. And it's, it's a clear cast resin garden of plants and a tree on endangered lists around the globe. And it's accompanied by a whispering script on loss. And so the sound really takes over, even though it's looking at more of an object-based piece, um, the sound is what makes it immersive. Um, this piece first I was inspired um, by the tree. This is a, a bois dentelle. Um, and I had contacted uh, Christopher Bumberry Kaiser, who is a, a remote ecologist um, working in remote areas to restorative projects. And this tree at the time, there were two on the planet because it had no commercial value. And he was really working um, with efforts of growing them in nurseries. And so um, he sent me photos so that I could recreate this. Um, tree. The other plants um, are from around the world. Um, every petal, every leaf, every stem was created separately and assembled. I wanted them to look ghostly, um, fragile as if they were uh, glass or uh, water or ice that could melt into water. Um, and the script I wrote after I lost my mother. And so the script is really a sad um, kind of script on loss. And, and I like the idea of comparing it with plants. One in five plants, one in five is headed towards extinction. And yet we don't talk about it. They, they don't get the attention in the biodiversity debates. And yet if we lose our habitats, we lose everything. All the mammals, all the insects, all the birds, all the reptiles. And so um, this was a, an example of me really taking this notion um, of adding emotion into something that is more data driven, as well as putting um, an aesthetic tone to it. You know, I just noticed in that, and I've looked at that work because we talked about, should you create a work, you know, in that vein? Um, it looked as if the floorboards were pulling up. Yeah. So Did there's you have a piece almost emerging through the floorboard. It's a, it's a false floor. And so whether or not they're sinking in or going up is, is supposed to be slightly ambiguous, but yeah. 
Wow, stunning. I never thought that. And, and I had made the false floor. And then when I um, installed that at the Utah Museum of Art, their floor was exactly the same. And so it worked perfect. It was a perfect like mirage um, yeah. of that. But it was intentional to, you know, what's happening? Is it slipping through the crack? Or yeah. is it seeping from, you know, coming in from below? I love it. Those the, the attention to detail like that is is always what makes a work sublime because it was so convincing. But I honestly, in in research, looked at that work, but never, I guess, that closely or, or for that amount of time. Um, <clears throat> so my third and final question um, sort of continues your discussion, your presentation is <clears throat> it is fascinating that your work balances being both profound and didactic. I feel your sense of providing beauty through impeccable craft may be the secret. Both are often viewed as a negative within the art word, world, referencing beauty and craft. Would you please share your thoughts? And I and the, uh, the, the newer body of work from the evaporated explorations in art, science and salt is so stunning. Uh, and then coming with such an interesting science conceptual, uh, academic background, but the object itself, you plop it into any space, people just gravitate towards its beauty. And I think um, that's what you're able to provide for your exhibition at the low. But I'd like to hear how you're able to reconcile all of these really important aspects of your work, but still manage to focus on craft and beauty. Yeah, that's a, a great question. You know, one, I, I kind of grew up doing craft. I, I grew up in rural Wisconsin. And so everything from needlework, beadwork, pressing flowers and leaves. Um, and so there, I have this tendency to craft. I often just feel like my hands just want to make. Um, and even a lot of my videos, I'm making sculpture objects that they're projected onto. But I love this, this making. Um, and don't, you know, I, I can't quell it. Um, but at the same time, I think I've always been interested in the beautiful object, always. Uh, I, I felt like, I don't know, sometimes when things are really tough, it's like the one little piece of light I can hang on to. And, and I'm interested in and providing some of that for the viewer or finding a, a, a moment of hope or a little light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and so that it's been a challenge to address some of these climate change issues or data and make it really beautiful. I mean, that sometimes is the challenge. And where I found that that works is when I take something very personal and then I'm making it on this personal aspect. And then of course the craft. The craft also is very meditative um, for me. And I'll show a couple of um, pieces. Um, this piece is called Shattered. And um, it's an example of still creating this immersive uh, kind of spaces and these immersive experiences um, with an object, with a single object and using light. Light has always been um, an important aspect for me. And, and like I say, this kind of hope that I've been drawn to. And then the mirror has always been a big part. And first I started using mirror as a way to harness sunlight, um, as a way to reflect light in group shows where I had to have ambient light and couldn't control the light situation, but also for the viewers to see themselves. Um, so there's literally when people are standing close to the piece, it's reflecting the architecture, but it reflects the color of their clothing, the color of their skin or hair. Um, sometimes you can catch your eye in one of the pieces. And, and I often think of um, Arthur Danto's uh, quote where he says, we go back to look at a work of art again and again, not in hopes of seeing something new in the work, but in hopes of seeing something new in ourselves. And so the mirror has really become uh, an important part for me to include the viewer in a physical way with the work as well. Um, and then, you know, the craft, I, I've done a lot with wire. There's something about the meditation of me just making and making um, that uh, I really like. And, and here's another example of um, how an installation can create an immersive experience. And the light here creates these kind of neurological drawings on the floor with the shadows. Uh, I've made a number of trees using black wire and mirrored mylar for the leaves. This piece is called Still Searching, and I wanted to have a forest. Uh, I made these when I was on a residency on the west coast of Florida, and so uh, it's no surprise that they became like these aquatic tentacles 
um, searching for a foundation or nomadic in nature. And uh, I've made another piece, this is called Entwined, which I recently showed at the art kiosk in Redwood City. Um, and this is really about a relationship. And mo many trees actually share their nutrients uh, through their roots underground. But in many ways, and especially in hindsight, when I was reinstalling this, I was just thinking how this is a love story. This is um, certainly a relationship with this particular piece. I've also created um, a tapestry. This was the other piece that I showed at the art kiosk in Redwood City, although this is taken from the um, Museum of Art in Fort Lauderdale, um, where it's a, a kind of a, a tapestry of trees that hang in front of the wall. And then the most recent one is reflecting hope. So the mirrored mylar leaves um, reflect onto the walls uh, and in the space at the low, they really have a different function in some ways. They become very silvery, like mercury. Um, and at the same time, uh, it being in this kind of fishbowl, I was thinking how it's on display. It's like in a protective case. And you can even stand outside and see the tree inside, right? There's something kind of very interesting there. Um, and with this one, the, the wire trunk became like, um, it almost became like hair. And um, there's, uh, it, it's just kind of how it, it came about. And in the picture on the left, you can see some purple in the leaves. And that was a viewer wearing a purple dress. That was, uh, it's just an example of how that kind of changes the color. The viewers themselves can change um, some of the visuals with the piece. And just a fun fact about this. So normally I never keep track of how many hours I spend because I think I, <laughs> It would it would reveal my obsession or how much material that I use. Um, but uh, because I made this during the pandemic and I bought everything online, I was able to track uh, how much wire. And there is over six miles of wire in this particular tree, which is over 59,000 feet. And as my husband pointed out, that's the height of Mount Everest. So a little window into my obsessive uh, and compulsive nature around, around craft. That was fantastic. You know, I'm so thrilled because in a short amount of time together, we were able show, to show Entwined and Woven out here in California, which had a similar kind of space to the low where it, um, it is a glass, a big public art glass vitrine. Uh, and when sunlight comes through the windows or artificial lighting at nighttime, the work takes on a different um, quality and provides a different experience for the viewer, but all three were just extremely beautiful um, in how they're crafted and how they're perceived by the viewer. Um, I just want to sum up, um, because I know Mark will then uh, pick up with a bit of a Q&A before we end, your conversation and everything that you bring to your art practice um, is so well thought out and felt and has taken a life to evolve to. And also being in academia and a teacher and in having it advise my students, art students on how to navigate this new AI art making process. <laughs> this is the kind of conversation that allows us to separate ourselves as artists from humans from machine, right? And so although machine or even a skilled craftsperson can make things technically, it's another thing to make work that provokes, that responds, that reacts to, and that is personal. And I think you've done a really uh, amazing um, uh, body of work. And I'm so happy that we were able to share it at the Lowe Museum. Oh, thank you. So I think Mark is gonna pick it up from here. I think you're still muted. Yep, of course. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. That was fascinating. And I love taking that deep dive into your work, Wendy. So uh, for people who are participating, if you do have questions, either for Lance or Wendy, please put them into the chat. There is one uh, question slash comment that I'll, I'll throw out to both of you, which is um, from Don. He's saying, doing science makes an effort to be unbiased when collecting and interpreting data. Is there a bias infused in the artistic representation of data? I Absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's what art can do. 
Um, you know, which I think then there's a responsibility of the artist to really understand the data, which is why I, I read all the papers that they write. I go on the field visits. I learn on the ground what they're doing so that I am able to communicate that um, in, in a thorough way, in an honest way, and go a little deeper. It makes my work stronger that I have a deeper understanding. However, I'm completely biased. Um, you know, one, I've already said, I have a deep affection for the planet. So things that are destroying it, I'm against, and that's okay. Um, I can make a nod. Even the tire makes a nod that at the culprit of the racers, right? Um, it's a little tricky because um, there's a relationship that my collaborator has with the BLM, um, with the, the my extraction company, um, with the racing community. And so I had to tread a little light in terms of um, where I pointed the finger or how I did that. But the fact that it's art, it could be interpreted in a lot of different ways. So yes, absolutely is biased. That's the need for art. Art is great at institutional critique. And science is not even supposed to go there. This is why they need us. And I also think um, that that bias or preference or point of view um, is valued when it's used responsibly. Yeah. And I think if someone puts an art artwork out there and doesn't uh, uh, provide the appropriate context or artist or curatorial statement so that the viewer can clearly understand their point of view, um, not how it, the work should be interpreted or what it means, but rather the starting point of a conversation. When art's presented that way, then I think you can have a really important, interesting conversation. Um, and, and I agree. I mean, I like artists and artwork that have a point of view. Um, and, but, but it isn't, it, it was a, when I, when it came up, I thought, what a great question. Um, I just want to ask one one question, piggybacking off of that before we go on to um, Carla's question for Wendy. Um, your newest project is To Breathe, which I think is amazing. And to refresh everyone's memory, it's the piece that's happening in, in around Wendy's hometown on the buses, right? Um, what kind of tracking um, process have you embedded into that artwork so you can find out if it's effective, if yeah. people are reading, if it changes people's minds, or if it becomes a billboard that looks like a real estate ad. Yeah. Well, that that um, piece, In Search of Blue Sky, um, ran for the month of January. So um, I had we had received a grant, um, our team, and uh, we were able to run it. January is, is notoriously our worst air quality month. Um, and so I'm one, I'm able to track how many hits I get on the website that has the QR code that directly links to it. Um, we did a number of radio interviews. Those are also on the website now, but we, you know, we got attention out there through articles and through radio. Um, we have been looking at the um, atmospheric site and how many hits it got before, during, and after the project. There were some days that we saw spikes and some days that we didn't see you know, a change in their hits, um, that some people would just view it on mine, but wouldn't actually go to the real-time data. Um, but, but there were certainly some days that would, there were spikes. So that was the first time I've ever done a piece where you can actually track that. Um, we did have um, some surveys uh, with the show that showed the science data alongside the artwork about the Bonneville Salt Flats to try and, and collect that. It's always hard to know, um, you know, and, and it, some of it is just the awareness that we have these sensors, right? At this point, maybe they go and check them out later or they check out things. It's not the first time that the scientists had tried to um, get information out there. So this was just another um, way of trying to do that. But then I had a lot of, you know, it's personal testimony. Students and friends would take pictures and send it to me and people to ask, saw it, and, you know. Um, so some of it is that too. I, I think since art has the capacity to change consciousness, it's very hard to um, quantify that. I think social media too, um, particularly since your work is in the public realm, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of tracks. Mm -hmm. Great, I have two, two more questions uh, for you, Wendy's. One is from Carla, which is during your art making process, do you take into consideration using more eco-friendly materials to create your art? 
Uh, that's a great question. And um, I do, I'm always thinking about it. Um, some, some of the things I've created have created a tremendous amount of waste. Um, and so I have the an extravagant collection of scraps that I use and reuse. Um, I, you know, take the time to drive any, when I've used styrofoam, there's really only one place that re recycles styrofoam and that's the company that makes it. Um, as to make sure I take it all back and so that they're really recycling it. Um, and some things just aren't able yet, right? We're not at a point where we have certain materials um, that are all coming from recycled places, but I do. And I also really feel, um, at a minimum, it's important that I continue thinking about that. I continue thinking about my studio practice and how much I'm using and reusing. And I also, you know, being in academia, I get the opportunity to upcycle and give, um, you know, precious scraps to students who don't have the funds to buy them. And um, I, you know, I, it's, it's a, it is a hard one too, though, because I'm not everything that I use comes from sustainable sources, but I'm aware of that and always working on it. Great, thanks. And so one more uh, question from uh, Marianne, which is uh, to you, Wendy, can you speak about your teaching practice? Yeah, um, so I teach sculpture and media, which um, was a term coined in the 60s referring to interdisciplinarity. I was drawn to this position because I teach kind of the fringe of sculpture in many ways. We have some traditional um, courses and, and pathways with, you know, wood and metal and mold making, but I teach installation and video, video mapping, um, conceptual practices, uh, as well as professional practice. Uh, there's a class that I created um, called Art Action in the Environment. And I teach that for my department, but also for the Honors College. So I'm teaching students from across campus who are not art majors. Um, we talk about socially engaged artwork and we do socially engaged artwork in the community. Um, and so it's like a part seminar, part studio class. And that has been um, just fascinating to see what topics that they choose for their capstone project, which has to be a, a local environmental issue since the community they're sharing with is local. Um, I also, I mean, going back to the question about materials, I have them do a mind map where they have to take a material that they want to use and they have to track the carbon footprint all the way from either its extraction or fabrication or um, and including shipping, of course. And, you know, just because they go to Home Depot, there's a carbon footprint to go to Home Depot to get something. Or if Amazon delivers it, there's a big carbon footprint. So even having that environmental literacy is super important around the materials that we use and talking about how wood is renewable where metal isn't, right? Um, and how can we you know, repurpose um, plastics? How can we repurpose things to have a more sustainable practice? So I also include that um, in some of the things that I, that I teach. Great, thank you. And unfortunately that puts us at time. So I wanna thank everyone who participated in the program tonight. Lance, thank you for your curation and also for guiding this discussion. The questions were, great in allowing Wendy to elicit and dive deep and give us real insight into her work. So truly appreciate that.